Um, I'm Steve Nara, and um, I uh, worked on a bunch of stuff at Apple. I guess back um, in the early days of Next, I was the founding member of the compiler team and made GCC work for Next and enhanced it to do Objective-C and enhanced it to do Objective-C++, which is this really crazy language we support. And um, I'll talk about some other stuff um, that I've done over the course of the talk. But, so that's who I am, and right now I'm working with Chris on an end front end. So um, this was the talk that was written about on the website. Um, I'm not here to talk about Objective-C. Most of you probably don't care about Objective-C, true? Does anyone know about Objective-C? Oh, people know, right? So we're adding garbage collection for each and properties, so that's all you have to know. That's the high level story. So, uh, <laughs> we're here to talk about um, an, uh, a, new, a new implementation of a new C front end. So um, let me go through and uh, describe what we're trying to do. So as far as I'm concerned, we need a rallying cry in the Apple and LLVM communities. We need a great front end for the next decade, right? We, you know, LLVM is beautiful, and we need a front end that has the same beauty to, to go with it. Right now, GCC is not quite um, as beautiful. <laughs> um, and uh, I think Chris, is, Chris has done amazing work to uh, put his head down and make it work. But it would be nice to have something that was a little bit uh, better for uh, the future. So why? Um, as I just said, it's difficult to work with. Um, the learning curve is steep for many developers. The, the GCC inside crowd. Obviously, they're used to it, so um, they know it, and it's not that um, big a deal for a lot of those folks. And when I was 27 and doing the work I just said I did, it wasn't a big deal for me either. Um, but I'm a lot older now, and I can't bear to work in that environment anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to me, it was either retire or work with Chris. And I chose working with Chris over retiring for now. So, um, um, the implementation and politics limit innovation, to me, it's a little bit sad. You know, GCC pioneered the open source revolution. And um, unfortunately, I think it's, it's in fact a problem now. With, with the, uh, to me, open source is about opening up ideas, teaching people new idioms, patterns, having people who aren't necessarily compiler experts get to work on compilers, right? And, 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 that's, and like you said, mere mortals, and I'm going to use that term later on in the talk, we want that property to, be, property to be true for the front end as well. So anyway, a, a good example of politics I'll give you, because you're probably thinking, what, what is politics? Well, there's lots of examples, but I'll give you one. Um, in um, the early 90s, um, Next had some real big problems with compile time, even though we had done the native um, compiler. And that's because Next pioneers, Next pioneered <coughs> large libraries, right? Uh, at that time, the C library was small. C++ didn't have a library at the time. And um, we were having real big problems with compile time. So I went to Richard Stallman, and I said, we really need pre-compiled headers. You know, a lot of other compilers, like Borland and others, have pre-compiled headers. Can, can we do that um, to um, GCC? And he said, no, I don't want to do pre-compiled headers. So there's an example of politics at the time. Richard was the lead. Um, and as prolific as Richard is, he didn't want to do pre-compiled headers. So um, we had to make our own plans for solving that problem again. Um, and the solution was to implement something called DevKit. So I and another very talented intern at Apple um, worked on something called DevKit that is still in use today. And um, it filled the void that GCC um, was creating for us. Um, so the very first job was to have DevKit implement pre-compiled headers, which we did. And that scheme um, lasted about a decade. And then Jeff Keating, who's in the room today, who works on GCC, fortunately implemented a scheme in GCC. But that was 12 years after I asked Richard for it. right? And for a company like Next and Apple that's very aggressive, 12 years is too long to wait to make the compiler faster. So, um, so DevKit's still in use today. Um, and um, we needed to, to serve our IDE. Again, the open source community is about mostly about command line. It's about um, ubiquity. There is, uh, other than, I think, uh, our IDE, there probably isn't any great IDE for GCC. So we care more about that. 
uh, than uh, other vendors who are working in the open source community. So the big problem with this approach is you have two preprocessors, two parsers, uh, two lexers, and so developers get different answers. Sometimes when they're in the IDE, their code doesn't index properly and they can't understand why. GCC is compiling it. Why doesn't it index properly? So it's very confusing to them and it's a maintenance nightmare to us. Okay, so, so we, we lived with this because we had to live with it um, 15, 20 years ago. And my hope at the time was um, that DevKit or its approach would be, let's say, adopted by GC, GCC over time. That the GCC community would understand the benefits of using C++ abstraction and reusable libraries and so on. Well, that didn't happen, right? So that didn't happen. So my only other hope at the time was that um, Next or now Apple would finance a back end that could, that could go with DevKit. Well, that too didn't happen, okay? So the third option, which I never considered, happened. Chris and LLVM, um, was happening, we noticed it, and we said, wow, this, this would be a great opportunity to actually achieve our goals. So that was one of the um, virtues we saw in, in LLVM early on. Yes? So why, why didn't you use the GCC for indexing? Why did you use two different tools, one for indexing and one for compiling? GCC was too heavy. Um, number one, it was too heavy. Number um, two, it's very important in an IDE the code be indexable without, it, without being correct. So it needs to, um, DevKit is fuzzy. Okay, and I'm going to talk a little bit of uh, work. This this toolkit and framework we're working on is also supports fuzziness. That's good. I mean, okay. <laughs> uh, so, what are our goals? A unified parser for C-based languages. So, our, our our big thing is language conformance for the three languages I've outlined there. I haven't listed Objective C++. That's assumed. Um, I should have included it. GCC compatibility. All the code at Apple currently compiles with GCC. Moving from uh, MetroWorks to GCC, I lived through that, and I know how hard that was. And I know, and I don't trivialize that compatibility uh, fully. But nevertheless, it has to be a goal of ours. And um, expressive diagnostics. So, and just to be clear, what I mean by unified. Currently, GCC, even though it supports four different dialects of C, all of them are actually in different executables. Okay, so we have an executable that's you know five megabytes for um, each language. The place that fights us is with precompiled headers. The data structures are different for each um, processor and for each language. So there's a combinatorial explosion of precompiled headers we have to generate when anything changes in a, in a header. Okay. And I don't have to get into the details here, but it's a problem. Library-based architecture. Um, this is basically a, the, the front-end equivalent to what LLVM is. We want it to be usable and extensible by mere mortals. And let me give a definition of what I mean by mere mortal. I mean that um, you're not a compiler expert, but you have programmed in C or C++, and you're knowledgeable about a domain, let's say source code refactor or let's say static analysis, um, that you will be able to use this without feeling like you need to know a lot about parsers or about lexers or about preprocessors, right? So there are an awful lot of people out there who want to write tools who, when they're confronted with GCC, are just too intimidated and cannot deal with it. So that's what I mean there. Um, it needs to be multi-purpose. It needs to support anything you can imagine wanting to do with a front end, okay? Um, it needs to be multi-instance, right? If I'm in an IDE and I want to instantiate a parser and parse a message expression, um, I should be able to do that. You shouldn't have to parse modules or even functions. You should be able to parse expressions. So fine grain, multi-instance, so on and so forth. Um, so uh, high performance, it needs to um, be fast and it needs to be lean on memory. GCC um, allocates lots of memory um, and I'll show you some slides um, later that um, show the difference between what we're talking about and what GCC does. And lazy evaluation. DevKit, the, um, the uh, framework I talked about, how it did pre-compiled headers was really interesting. It had a database of declarations and 
what it would do was, if it, if it saw a program, and it would process it, and it would look at all the function calls you made, and it would only pull out the declarations from the precompiled header that GCC needed to see. So it was interesting where its goal was to make GCC fast by just feeding it the declarations it needed to see. And we did that with lots of lazy evaluation. Nine goals. We are not going to obsolete GCC. It's here to stay. It'll be here until I'm long gone, I'm sure. Um, and um, it's just not pragmatic, and we respect its uh, ubiquity. And uh, it is a great compiler. And um, uh, it just doesn't or isn't interested in satisfying the goals we're interested in satisfying. It's as simple as that. And I, I also want to say that a lot of stuff has improved. The new C++ recursive descent front end that Mark Mitchell did is a wonderful piece of work. The data structures still stink, but the, the parser's great. Um, the preprocess is a wonderful piece of work. That was Zach and the guys did a great job on that. So it is not a total piece of crap. It is, um, you know, it, it is a real good compiler. Okay. It again just doesn't want to satisfy the needs that we that we need met. So. Um, and another non-goal is support non-C-based languages. We don't care about Java. There's plenty of people working on Java. Um, and I don't know who's working on Ada and Fortran, but we don't care about that either. So, um, <laughs> Apple is very centered around C-based languages at the bottom and scripting languages at the top. Uh, right? And so you were talking about language integration. Apple has done great language integration between our scripting languages and Objective-C and C. So we do a lot of work in that area, but we don't really do much uh, uh, integration between the statically compiled languages, with the exception of Objective-C++. But that's done, at, that's done at a language level. That's not done at a runtime level. So let's look at the high-level architecture. Um, at the bottom, we're using system um, and support from LLVM, the casting stuff, and all the classes uh, listed there. We don't use much more than that. That's almost a complete list. Well, there, there is a bunch of stuff the, the past, I guess. OK, we use more. It, it uses a bunch of the stuff. <laughs> but anyway, that, that gives you a flavor. Um, there's a basic support library for sort. Uh, this is called the source manager. It does uh, source <coughs> locations, ranges, buffers, file caching and um, a bunch of stuff that's language neutral. So if we were to support other languages, this basic library could be reused uh, fairly easily. The next layer up is language specific. Uh, right now for C, um, we do lexing, preprocessing, and um, so on and so forth. The identifier hash table is very similar to what GCC has. Uh, unique uh, hash table of identifiers, tokens, with that, we have a parser. So we have a handle recursive descent parser. Earlier, I had a, a little rant about how we felt about compiler compilers. Uh, for this project, we're not using a compiler compiler, and it's worked out fine. It turns out that Chris and I feel a lot of the heavy lifting and the hard work in this framework is not in the parser. Okay, The parser, um, now I'm not saying a mere mortal is going to walk up and write a parser, a handle recursive descent parser. That's not the point. But we will do it. Um, we're language people. We write it once, and um, it should be easy it's, uh, to maintain. It's annotated with all the C99 spec references. And um, so we're, we're happy with the way that's turning out. But by far, the preprocessor is a lot <coughs> harder to get right. Chris wrote um, the preprocessor, and it's just a wonderful piece of work and uh, very fast and works really well. So this DevKit inspired actions. One of the decisions I made that I was happy with in DevKit is I, I made an absolute separation between syntax and semantics. So the parser delegates to another object that will basically perform the semantic actions um, for whatever it feels like doing. And that's where it supports the multiple um, instances and it supports um, multiple um, clients. So. Um, it's interesting because the parser can run, and I'll show you later, it can run without doing anything. No semantic analysis, absolutely nothing but parse. And that's really useful for performance benchmarking, and it's useful to keep that clear separation between syntax and semantics. Um, how can you pass parse C defaults during, for example, what's the time? Uh, say again? How can you parse C default 
Okay. The actions, the actions in its um, sub, the, the main actions module knows how to deal with type deaths minimally. So it does the minimal amount of type death analysis for C, and for C++ it will have to do some um, work for context sensitive keywords, type deaths. Right? So yes. Um, but the, the action writer is abstracted from that. That all works without you doing any work. Okay, so at the top level, and this is one thing that DevKit did not have. I was a little bit radical in that I was so anti-data structures and objects that I said, listen, whatever you want to do with it, create your own data structures. I have no idea what you want to do with this thing. So, you know, I defer to you. Um, that was good, but, but the problem is you want to, it, it's still, there was a, a high barrier of entry, right? That means you have to think a lot about the data structures. Um, so in this um, framework, we're, we're adding ASTs, which, which we think will be low cost and very useful, and we'll make sure that we don't include lots of silly data in that. Because um, you know, that's, that's one of the design flaws of GCC, is it puts too much into its data structures. It's, they're not factored very well. And that's a fixed me. Um, we don't have an AST to LLVM um, generator yet, um, but we will. So? Question? Yes. Oh. So what's the philosophy here on optimizations that some people do in the front end, like constant folding? Or we do no constant folding, OK? Uh, again, we want to support source to source translation. So these ASTs directly model what you typed. Okay, precisely. Okay, so we will do constant solving, but we will do it on the AST. Right, it'll be a separate pass. In, I mean, in, in contrast, GCC, as it's parsing, basically folds expressions as it goes, right? Which leads to a large class of bugs, you know, diagnosing diagnosing illegal constant expressions and stuff like that. And there's a, a lot of problems with that. If you're lining as constant that's probably lining the content. So. Okay. So this AST is very much oriented for the language that you parse? Absolutely. For Our ASTs, I'll show you the hierarchies and the objects later. Um, you will, being a C programmer, you will recognize them. Right? Um, so, um, so here, Chris um, has named it Clang. It's a driver right now. Clang is not the name of this framework. The framework is not named. In fact, I hear LLVM isn't even named. Which, um, you know, that's another story, but <laughs> this is a, a, a working thing. Yes, yeah. Steve has realized that I'm not very good at naming things. <laughs> <laughs> I told him he could have the name Dev Kid if he likes it, so we'll see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so here's a sample driver, you know, some, uh, basic stuff. Um, we support multiple arch options. Um, the third thing here, you can see we have a switch called parse no op. Um, we're giving it this big header, which I'll talk about later. Um, all that says is install the actions module, which does nothing but, again, the slight bit of type analysis that has to be done. And so um, we're able to time um, it without doing any semantic analysis. So then when you take that switch away and we build the ASTs and if we do type checking, you know exactly what the cost is. And again, I'll show you data to show you how fast uh, this compiler is. So before we get into a bunch of numbers, let's look at diagnostics. Remember I said this was a goal of ours. So this is a silly contrived example that um, fit on the slide. And you can see that GCC um, produces two errors here, invalid type argument and the invalid operands to binary. And you really, you have to look at the code quite a bit to, to understand what it's really saying. Um, here's what Clang um, does. So I don't even have to show you the code. In fact, notice I, I took the code away. Yet you can see the error diagnostics are way better. Number one is the, diagno the first diagnostic is actually telling you what's wrong, right? Indirection requires a point. Well, that doesn't tell me that. It just says it's an invalid type to unary star. Right? That's number one improvement. Number two is it tells you what the type is. Well, that's nice. And number three, and certainly not least, is it highlights the exact point the error occurred and the range of the expression that it's complaining about, right? So it's very nice. And in an IDE, you would take this information and draw bubbles and cute graphics and stuff. But this is what we can do with a command line. Right? 
The old dev kit did not do the old dev kit would actually pinpoint the exact location. The old dev kit did not do this well. Oh, no. no. <coughs> Once we got pre-compiled headers working and some of the other tools, you know, uh, we, we started, um, I don't know, not investing in the details, I'd say. So now we're investing in the details. So you just saw the, um, the output. That, that output, if you did that naively and stored source locations for every possible node in the ASD, would make the ASTs really fast. Okay? Um, so we don't do that. So what we do is we, we derive it, because let's face it, when you have an error, it's not important that the compiler's fast at that point, the processors are fast. So we ask the expression, what is your range? And it does a, a, a search, and it bubbles up to the top, and it computes its range. And then we hand over the range to the um, error diagnostics code. And the error diagnostics code, even though it has the range, still doesn't know the extent. So what it does is it takes the source location. From it, derives the logical location, the file ID. And it instantiates a lexer okay, on the fly to just get the length of the token. Okay. This is incredibly cool. This is incredibly cool. Chris wrote this routine, and when I saw it, I was, because I, I did the range stuff. I said, Chris, now plug it into your stuff. And he did it. And when I saw this routine, it, it was just, it's great stuff. Um, but if it drives home that in this day and age, thinking deeply about the um, space time trade off is, is a really interesting problem, and I think something we can get right. Now, whereas traditionally compilers um, that were built two decades ago, they said, man, I better learn everything I can about this program fragment at this point in time because I can't go back. It just wasn't part of the design space. So, Okay, so now let's talk about a bunch of numbers. How, how am I doing on time? What? Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about some performance relative to compiling this thing called carbon.h. Most of you probably aren't Mac programmers, um, um, other than the Apple people, obviously. But um, this um, is uh, the public API to a lot of our system services. And it's big, this file, right? 12.3 megabytes. Actually, the file is really small. Yeah. The one file is small. The source files which feed in to, to it um, are large. And you can see there's quite a bit of stuff there. I don't have to go through it. You guys are capable of reading what's there. So let's look at time on a few uh, gigahertz Intel Core Duo. So right now, we spend that amount of time doing pre-processing and lexing. We spend that amount of time doing parsing. Right, almost nothing. And we spend that amount of time doing semantic analysis and tree building. Okay, so it roughly breaks down to 65, 10, 25. Okay, that's, um, that's how we're dealing with it now. So, to process 12.3 um, megabytes of goop, we're doing it in a quarter of a second on you know, a pretty mainstream processor. So we're pretty proud of that. Um, GCC, um, its preprocessor is about twice as slow as ours right now. And considering the effort that went into making it that fast, again, Chris is just amazing that he was able to compete with it so quickly. And, um, it turns out that, as I said, it's unconventional that a compiler can actually measure that uh, middle number we're measuring. I can't do it in GCC. The closest you could get with GCC is dash F syntax only, and that isn't just parsing. It does a lot of other stuff. So that's how it breaks down. And at least for doing the same batch type of compilation that GCC does, we're two and a half times faster at the moment. Okay. So. Two and a half times is good. That's me, I'm sorry. Um, we really want 10x. So the way to get 10x is to um, have whole program ASTs. So we want to, um, our goal is to make these space efficient, easy to access, serialize them for disk, and basically um, have uh, the equivalent of pre-compiled headers for your whole program except they're not headers, it's just pre-compiled code. Um, and the benefit here is it'll make everything faster, okay? Um, 
In fact, um, one of the folks here did refactoring with our old dev kit in Xcode. In fact, we're releasing it really soon. And um, uh, one of the issues is since we don't support precompiled headers, you know, circa 1990 anymore because it was a feature that was replaced by Mr. Keating's work, um, uh, we unfortunately have refactoring that isn't as fast as it could be. Right? So uh, we hope to bring back um, this type of speed benefit in this new front end and have all these uh, types of applications benefit from that. So let's look at the space. So as I said, the input source here is that. Now, the pre-processed source is only 3.5 megabytes. So that explains why we're spending 65% in the preprocessor, right? It's having to eat that much more uh, code. Um, now, here's the ASTs we have. Now, it turns out that the most um, costly bit of um, data are the identifiers and strings. Okay, so they're 2.1 megabytes. Now, I include them because even though they're not in AST, they are data that the AST needs to be useful, right? Um, so, but still, very exciting that it's only 30% larger than the source code, right? Which is pretty cool because it's in a highly structured, very useful form, and 30% is not a big price to pay, especially when you look at the GCC trees, which are that, right? <laughs> Now, it's a little bit unfair, right? Because the abstract syntax trees don't contain a lot of the data that GCC does. GCC trees contain data for um, generating code, right? RASTs don't do any of that. But it turns out this is a header file. So guess what? Most of GCC's data structures are filled with zeros, right? Again, because it's not factored correctly, right? So um, whatever. Um, uh, we're excited about this, and, and it, I should note down here these numbers. These are the number of instances of the AST. So uh, we have about 50,000 decal ASTs, 31,000 uh, statements and expressions, and 26,000 types for, for this. So. so now let's just review what the ASTs look like. The most um, interesting class hierarchy we have is for declarations. So um, there's the root decal, which is abstract. We have a value decal, field decal, and type decal. And um, right below that, we have functions, variables, and a new constants. We have um, right below variables, we have all the scope information that's encapsulated in the class um, type. So when you get an object um, of one of these classes, you could ask it, are you a block variable, or your file variable, that kind of stuff. Um, here we have tag decals, type deck decals, and records in a new. So this is it for declarations. It, it, the hierarchies work well for us. It's fairly straightforward. And if you superimpose how many instances uh, each of these guys. And the reason it's interesting to look at the number of instances is part of the reason this is factored this way is for performance. Now it just turns out that the way we modeled it and performance actually go hand in glove. Right? There's nothing unnatural about this hierarchy for performance reasons. Right? So it is interesting when the two um, come together, when you say, wow, that, that makes sense. And yeah, that's, so let me give you an example. Enum constants. If enum constants were just, let's say we didn't have it structured this way, but everything was a decal. Okay? Well, if everything was a decal, like in GCC, these guys need to know about um, their storage class. Well, you don't need that information for the new constant, right? So it turns out that the new constants, there's 20,000 of them. You want them to be really cheap. And it turns out that on average, there are, um, each of these um, you pay a slightly different cost for, but the average is 30 bytes. So if you look at carbon.h, uh, it's about 30 bytes per AST uh, for decades. So here's the type hierarchy. All type is a smart pointer type that points to the actual type. Okay, call type, um, if you're programming C, you can imagine is const um, restrict volatile, and it is encoded in the low order three bits, and the rest of the word uh, points to a type, right? So it's a smart pointer, it saves space, and it's still a nice API. Um, type has 
these uh, classes, which again model the, uh, the type system in C. Types are unique, I should mention, just like GCC, um, unique types. Um, we also store the canonical type, so every type you could ask it for its canonical type, and that just removes all the type defs. So normally a type contains all the type defs, and the type checker, which I was just working on, always has to make sure it's operating on the canonical type, which is the actual type. And uh, we have uh, function protos, and so that's it for types. This is how many we have. We have 13,000 um, function prototypes there. And this is, this is all flat. I just grouped these classes based on their logical grouping, right? Uh, but this is a flat hierarchy, um, again, just to save space. Very boring. And expressions are also very boring. Expressions inherit from statement right now. And it's been working well for us. And um, so anyway, that's, that's what I have for syntax trees. And I'm just going to close with two guiding thoughts. Our fearless leader, Steve Jobs, loves this quote. If you've read anything about Steve Jobs, you probably know he loves this quote. Um, so I'm not listing it for that reason. I'm listing it because a lot of this work that we're doing is hardcore engineering, okay? It's not research, okay? It's not interesting at all from a research perspective. But it is interesting um, because I think it's going to enable a much broader class of tools. And I think it's all about uh, stealing the best ideas we've taken from GCC, we've taken from the old dev kit, we've taken, Chris and I have taken from wherever we can, okay? And uh, we think right now it's holding together and we hope it gets even cleaner. And this, this last um, thought by Sam Harbison, who actually wrote a great book on C um, with Guy Steele, which is the book I've been coding to. I, I use two things to code, the, we're using two things to code the front end, the C standard, as you can imagine, and Harvison and Steel, which again is a really great book. This is a, I, I think, a really profound little group of sentences. Um, and I think it really explains. Chris, did I have to read this? You said you wanted me to read it. You can just leave it up there. Okay. The, the font's big. You can, you can read it, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, anyway, questions? Do you um, support the um, broader funky? Actually, the syntax that JCC has given us so generously. Well, well, as my slides, we'll have to. At this moment, I don't think we do, but we will. Oh yeah, <laughs> that means you have to understand it. It doesn't seem that the documentation on GCC, in GCC understands. Well, we're fortunate. We have the, we have in this room, in fact, some of the best GCC experts on the planet. We could walk down to their office and say, if you can answer this, great. If not, please get us the answer to this. <laughs> or show us where to look. You know, right? so, yeah. Yeah. so Picasso had another saying that happens to be my favorite, which is, it takes a very, very long time to become young. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yes. You mentioned that you were going to write a C++ front end. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not going to. <laughs> 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 okay, I just want to say I am. I told Chris I don't feel I'm capable unless he wants to wait 10 years. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, there's a distinct lack of decent C++ front ends out there. We know. We know. Well, in fact, I think it's it's funny that for as I think when Java hit the streets. It deflected a lot of energy and enthusiasm for doing great tools for C. Okay. Well, two things happened. GCC became so popular and overwhelmed a lot of the tools vendors, and people like Metroworks went out of business. And 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 Java became so popular. And people who write tools said, "I'd much rather write tools for Java. I don't have a preprocessor, right?" Um, <laughs> so um, you know, I I recognize C is 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 tough, and we're just going to have to. Um, Chris and I and the company will have to figure out what we do. We want to do C and Objective-C well, and then we'll take that step. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. we, Chris, do you have anything to we, add on that? Yeah, I mean, we, we know and love C++. We obviously use it a lot. Uh, but And there's a lot of value in having a better C++ front end, both in terms of diagnostics, compile time, a lot of other things. But it's just a big project. Yeah, um, and I, I would be delighted to have a good C++ front end. Right. 
in the open source community, but there, 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 are, there are reasons why there isn't one. <laughs> back, back when I was managing, I talked to EDG and tried to get them interested in open source and different things, and they are not interested in open source and not interested in adding Objective-C. So we tried to go down that path, but it doesn't work. What's, uh, what's your license model? The same license as LLVM. It's going to be under the university. Exact same stuff. Yeah. Sweet. So we we aren't planning on releasing it immediately. So we want to be able to further along before we release it. But probably in the next few months or something. For the transport to every single VCC station? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. No. no. There's no way. To be totally frank about it, patches accepted. We have to do what? Patches accepted. Yeah, it'll it'll probably we'll try and push a lot of our system through it and do that set of things, and and we'll see. But we have to do it right because we throughout our Xcode everything we use GCC extension. But he said every GCC extension. Okay. Oh, I don't believe that. No, no. no. So we want this. Well, anyway, this is this is certainly up for discussion. Um, so it's like the attribute mode doesn't seem to make any sense supporting anything else well, other than GCC, right? So a lot of attribute would probably can be just carry over transparently by trying to. Uh, actually, the, the attributes are one, in my opinion, are one of the good things about GCC. I mean, yeah, attributes yeah. are a very clean way to add metadata to the to the code. Yeah, but uh, okay. Yeah, the actual, the actual yeah. a attributes themselves maybe have a yeah. questionable we value. We a large set of attributes in your, your own code, so we have to support it. Yeah. It depends. Not every attribute has to be understood by friendly, right? This is the detail we can take it off. Yeah, I'm probably not that concerned about attributes. We'll figure that out. That's the thing you refuse to implement. Yeah, for now, Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the, the short version is that we'll implement some subset, some subset of stuff, and then if people want to extend it, then that's that's great. Yes. So uh, two things: is this going to be a sub project of LLVM or whatever it becomes, or yeah, something? I think. I mean, Chris is that's Chris's okay. question. Okay. So then there seems to be a fair amount of problems. overlap between HL or at least pieces of this and and pieces of HLVM. Um, it sounds like we need to have a discussion so that we don't duplicate sure. work. And I mean, I'm all for discussing it. We can include Chris in and decide what we want to do. Okay. Yeah. And, um, 